So for our third speaker this morning on data, I'd like to invite Kate Crawford, a principal researcher at Microsoft. She's been calling for a more cautious approach to the expectations we have for big data and the benefits that it might provide us. Kate, come and join me on stage, please. Hey. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here. And welcome to Dataland, a chance to begin again in a new world of opportunity and adventure. In Dataland, we are tracking you 24-7. We know what you like to eat. We know when you sleep. We know about the health of your body and your mind. We like to guide your path through the city to make sure that you're avoiding any risky areas that our security algorithms have decided are not quite right for you. We have such an efficient energy grid that we like to make sure that you're using the best possible amount of energy as you move from room to room, so we make sure we track that as well. We even pre-screen any job offers or credit offers that might be sent to you to make sure that they're absolutely going to suit your lifestyle. And then, obviously, the more data that we can collect about you, the safer you will be. Well, this sounds a little bit like science fiction, I grant you. But this is actually a lot closer to reality than you might know. So this is a picture of Andorra. Andorra is a tiny country nestled up in the Pyrenees Mountains between France and Spain. Now, Andorra had a bit of a hard time with the Euro crisis economy, so what they did is they came up with a radical new idea. They would sell all of the data about their citizens. That is, their internet browsing histories. That is, their customer records. That is, the city sensors that are gathering information about where they move every day. Andorra's plan is to become the first smart country. They think that in some ways, the smart city is almost not ambitious enough. In their own words, they want to become the first real-world lab. Well, I don't know about you, but I've got a few questions about this kind of real-world lab. The first one is that this is a pretty big experiment that we're running here. And it's an experiment with no ethics process, with no consent, and significantly, with no opt-out. So if you're a citizen of Andorra, your experience of this is going to be that ultimately you don't get any financial recompense for your data, you don't get to change your privacy settings, and you don't get to opt-out. For as long as you live in Andorra, your data is out there, and you cannot determine any way that that's going to stop or when it's going to end. So what we're seeing here is a pretty radical step, and you might say this is a lot further from where we are right now. But just how different is this from our big data practices? Well, we already know that our cell phone companies are, in fact, aggregating and selling our customer records. We know that with Twitter and Facebook, we can give you incredible insights about what we're thinking and what we're doing. And, of course, if we really look at what's happening with the smart grid right now, the smart grid can track every time you go into your house, turn on your lights, maybe make some coffee, and run a bath. That is all being tracked right now. So in many ways, we are in a great social experiment. And all I want to do today is raise three questions that we might actually want to pose about how this experiment is going to play out. So the first concern I have is the myth of objectivity. Now, I'm an interdisciplinary research science. I work in a lab with a whole lot of people who are doing big data science all the time. I love doing big data science. I think there's an enormous amount of potential here. But I get concerned when I hear the emergence of something that I call big data fundamentalism, when people say that ultimately, well, correlation is pretty much as good as causation, and that with massive data sets and predictive analytics, we can more or less get to objective truth. And this is more common than you might think. So let me give you an example of where this fails. So in October last year, I was tracking Hurricane Sandy very closely for two reasons. The first is that I've done large data studies of what happens during a crisis event, how people's communications patterns will change. The second reason 
is that I was living in zone A in New York City. So I was right in the evacuation zone. So as the water started flooding into my street and as the lights in my building went dark, I became a member of a brand new neighborhood of Manhattan, known as Sopo, south of power. So that wasn't great for me, but fortunately back at work, the servers were still collecting data, and they collected a lot of it. In fact, we might be able to get exact figures from Deb, but we saw around 25 million tweets about Sandy over four days. Now that represents a fantastic data set for analysts and researchers like me. But there's a problem. The problem is, and we saw this in multiple news stories and even research papers, is if we assume that data represents what happened in New York City. Because in actual fact, that data looks a lot like this map of SOPO. It's really focused in Manhattan. This is a map of all of the tweets about Sandy produced by the fantastic people at Social Flow. It is intensely concentrated in Manhattan. Now, that makes sense because that's where we see the highest amount of smartphone ownership and Twitter use. But that is not where the majority of the damage was occurring. It was in places like Breezy Point and the Rockaways and Coney Island, places where there are very few, if any, tweets. And, of course, as the power stays out for days and in some cases weeks, this problem gets worse. So if we start to use social media data sets to take the pulse of a nation, or to understand what's happening in a serious crisis, or to actually allocate resources, be it emergency workers or disaster relief funds, we're actually getting a skewed picture of what is happening. And we're missing out on the people who are really getting affected, the ones who are worst hit. These are the people who are the losers, not the winners, in these particular kinds of equations. So for me, I can see this also playing out in really large data sets from things like search data. You might think that search data is more representative in this case. Well, Google Flu Trends is a pretty stunning set of algorithms that Google has been using to predict flu rates from year to year. And they've been extremely accurate. Until this year, when they got almost twice the percentage of people coming down with flu as the CDC had. So it was a massive error of this particular data set. Now, according to Nature, the reason this happened was because there were so many horror flu stories coming out at the start of the year, and also because social media magnified those stories. But the real problem was that the algorithm was looking at this data as being objective and not looking at the complex context in which it is embedded. My favorite corrective to this idea that somehow big data is objective comes from Jeff Bowker, who wrote that raw data is both an oxymoron and a bad idea. On the contrary, data should be cooked with care. And this captures for me the way that we sometimes mistakenly think of data as something like a natural resource that we can just pull out of databases like we're pulling oil out of the ground. Nothing could be further from the truth. Data is something that we have to recognize. We massage it, we clean it, we prepare it. Data is actually a function of human creativity and thought. And in that sense, it actually requires an enormous amount of care and thinking in terms of how we use it. The second thing I want to talk about is data discrimination. Now, some people think that big data is really quite fantastic because you're working at a mass level and therefore you can't actually conduct group-based discrimination. It's actually quite the opposite. Big data is not colorblind, it's not gender blind, and in fact, marketers are using big data to have ever more precise categories about you. So, this is a really fascinating study that was done at Cambridge University of 60,000 people on Facebook and their likes. What they found is that simply by looking at what you like, you can predict somebody's sexuality, somebody's ethnic background, somebody's religious beliefs, and even whether they are a drug or alcohol user. Now, they were extremely accurate. The thing that they were best at was predicting whether you were Caucasian or African American. They had 95% accuracy. The next one was gender. The one after that was male sexuality. Female sexuality, much more complicated, way down the list. <laughs> what was interesting about this is that the researchers were very particular to point out that they were concerned that this data could be used by anyone. It could be used by government agencies. It could be used by employers. It could be used by landlords to make discriminations against you that you are not even aware are happening. And I think it's a legitimate concern. 
Another example for the potential for big data discrimination is something I call data redlining. Now, historically, Redlining was something that caused a considerable amount of civil rights activity, and we have laws in this country against redlining. But that's happening offline. Online, companies can make very particular decisions about who will see an offer for a particular type of loan. Now, if you're really attractive, you've got a really big bank balance, you look good to a bank, you'll see that offer. But let's say you really need that loan, and you're not incredibly wealthy. You won't see it at all. Which is why Scientific American earlier this year suggested that the rich are going to see a different internet to the poor. And that is something that I think we all need to think about the ramifications of how that's going to play out. So ultimately, if your buying history indicates that you're somebody who isn't entirely working with the best credit record, you're not going to get that offer. If your Facebook likes indicate that maybe you prefer to have a couple of glasses of wine at night, maybe you're not going to get that job. These are concerns that are present with us right now. And of course, our online behavior can unintentionally reveal a lot about our health. So say you buy an e-book about cancer survival, or you like a disease foundation's page on Facebook. These kinds of signals can be put together with a range of other kinds of data exhaust. So every time you buy medication, you've got an RFID tag on that particular medicine bottle, which can be put together with this data to generate a very detailed picture about you. What I find particularly concerning is that using predictive modeling, I don't even need to have your data. I can actually just look at a set of behaviors and look at your social graph, and sometimes make some very startlingly accurate predictions about you. Let me give you an example. This one is very famous, so some of you will know it. Target was looking at the purchases of a particular teenage girl, and they saw a spike in terms of a range of things like care products, bacterial hand wash, and they thought, huh, this woman is clearly pregnant. And they started sending out lovely coupons to get wonderful new baby products to the house. Unfortunately, this teenage girl had not told her family that she was pregnant. Nice way to find out. Actually, as it happened, Target was absolutely right. And what is interesting about this is that you cannot know the assessments that are being made about you. It's not that big data is effectively discriminating. It is, we know that it is. It's that you will never actually know what those discriminations are. And that's where I think the concern begins. The third point that I wanted to raise today is the end of anonymity. Now, back in 1930, Edmund Locard, who was one of the founders of forensic science, wanted to find out how many points it would take on a fingerprint to uniquely identify an individual. And he found that it was 12. How many do you think it takes for anonymous cell phone data? Well, we now know, thanks to a study in Nature this year, which looked at the cell phone records of 1.5 million people in an anonymous uh, European country, what they found is that it just takes four, four spatiotemporal points to uniquely identify 95% of individuals. That's pretty extraordinary. What that shows us is that our paths through cities are actually extremely unique. There aren't many people who live where you live and work where you work. We go on these very consistent paths that are very habitual, and they really identify us. So it's also extraordinary to think about why so many of these data sets are being anonymized and sold when there is still so much in there that can identify us. Thanks to academics like Alessandro Acquisti, we know that just by combining public data sets, we can actually, with a high level of predictability, actually pick out your social security number. Which is why the computer scientists are now saying that pretty much everything is PII, or personally identifiable information. Arvind Narayan wrote that anything that distinguishes one person from another can be used to identify you in an anonymous data set. This is interesting, too, given that both AT&T and Verizon quietly began selling their anonymized customer records this year. Now, I'm not suggesting that we give up on anonymization. It's incredibly important. It's something we have to keep doing. But even re-identification researchers are starting to get very concerned about publishing their data to show how many of these data sets are actually vulnerable. So ultimately, it's the amount of work that anonymization is being asked to do to justify this collection and then selling of big data that concerns me. It's no comfort, of course, to the citizens of Andorra, but these kinds of risks are very serious. I'm going to end with one of my favorite 
interdisciplinary thinkers, the uh, philosopher and mathematician Leibniz, who was writing in the early 1700s. He developed a theory called the possible worlds theory. And he used this as a way to test our ideas about the world that we live in and the worlds that we might create. Everybody here is participating in and sometimes designing the data systems that we are going to be living in. And I think it's really important that as we do that, we think about the ways in which people can be informed about the risks that they're taking on without being asked to sign things like this to give away their rights without even knowing how their data is being used. Ultimately, we need strong data ethics and procedural due process or privacy disasters like the Netflix challenge or AOL releasing its search data in a way that could actually then be identified, or the target pregnancy case will simply look quaint comparing to what's coming down the pipeline. And finally, I would suggest there is a time pressure here. Data land is almost with us. And I'd suggest that we can't afford to set up a system with no opt-out and no protections for its citizens. And frankly, it doesn't take a science fiction scenario to realize that that is what is at stake. Thanks. Kate, you make data sound at one and the same time both extremely coarse mm -hmm. in that it can be very misleading mm -hmm. if uh, uncooked, but also terrifyingly precise. That's right. Um, and our social and legal systems are unable to accept the degree of precision of PII that it now offers. I actually think both of those things are true. And what's they're really not intention. They're oh, they're absolutely happening simultaneously. Yeah. This is what's really interesting. So obviously, legal and policy systems are slow. They're much slower yeah. than what's happening in the technology industry. But data itself can be both very coarse and actually very identifying. And what's interesting is that sometimes we don't know which is which. <laughs> For the, the user, the person whose data is being collected, either of those can actually be quite deleterious to you. They can be quite damaging. If I predict something about you and I'm right, that can be just as dangerous as if I predict something about you and I'm wrong. So in both of these situations, even though I think predictive analytics has a long way to go, by no means is this like an incredibly fine-grained tool. The, the studies that I've shared with you today are all published this year. This is very recent work. So it's, it's very much the cutting edge. But take it five years from now, and we're going to be seeing that these kinds of techniques are really common. And we're going to see these problems. So right or wrong, I think we need to ask about what are the kinds of structures, what are the kinds of protections that we have for the people whose data is being collected? Thank you. I'll have Kate back on stage in a few minutes. Thanks so much, Jason. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>